Okay, sorry about the short delay. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Jenny Drenovich. I will be chairing the session here. Um, we will get started off. Um, speakers have nine minutes. I will be enforcing that with a very rude uh, alarm. But we'll start with Jared Brown from the Department of Data Science and Data Farber. Morning all, thanks for coming. Uh, the title says it all. I want to talk about optimizing signal and correcting for between cell type biases and heterogeneous spatial and single cell RNA-seq. I had to sneak that one into the spatial talk, um, which I'm sorry, does mean this is a normalization talk. Please don't run for the doors. There's hopefully something interesting in here. Um, as with so many of our projects, this was uh, inspired by some work I was doing analyzing data for a collaborator. In this case, uh, some spatial sequencing data from the lab of Dr. Beth Drolet, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, their Department of Dermatology. So this is not surprisingly a skin biopsy where we have in the H&E on the left, uh, the exterior epidermal layer on the bottom, more structural dermal tissue, I'm not going to give you the technical names. I don't know them. Um, some glandular tissue uh, sort of in the middle. Do I have a, I am not going to assume that folks online can see my cursor. Um, they can. They can see my cursor. Okay. So right about there, as I said, in the middle. And then uh, up at the top, uh, we're starting to hit adipose, fat tissue, and perhaps muscle. Um, and we can see in the middle, this is some 10x uh, Visium data, we can see that those structures match what you might expect from the total expression levels where, say, your glandular tissue in the middle, unsurprisingly, has multiplicatively higher levels of observed UMI counts compared to the less active adipose at the top. Um, and just on the right, for reference, we have some computationally derived clustering uh, for the time being, I'm wanting to focus on one of the glands, uh, cluster nine, roughly, versus the adipose tissue and roughly cluster two. And we can revisualize that, of course, as is often done with a, a UMAP plot. Here, I'm just showing that to sort of highlight one of the artifacts that, or one of the characteristics of these data that I'm focusing on is that in that comparison for, say, cluster two, we have relatively low levels of observed expression compared to the glandular tissue uh, cluster nine, uh, which is quite high. And in the context of normalization, the question I wanted to ask is, or question I was thinking about is, what assumptions about the biology does our choice of normalization imply? Um, and so in some contexts, if we make some assumptions, uh, we can get some nice results. In particular, if we suppose that all our samples, in this case, all our spots, this is Visium data, uh, are the same, uh, meaning there are no DE genes, just go with me uh, on that, um, and that the counts are approximately Poisson, then you can do a little bit of math and uh, drive the result that normalizing your counts uh, by sequencing depth is the MLE um, for, for that model. That is, you can derive a transformed normalized count YGJ for G and G and cell J uh, by scaling your raw counts by the column sum, the sum across genes for that spot, multiplied by some scaling parameter. If you want counts per million, alpha is one million. Um, the problem here is hopefully obvious. Assumption one is hideously violated in any interesting scenario. Uh, so let's look at something a bit different. Um, and let's focus on the full changes between any two groups. In this case, I'm thinking about uh, clusters two versus nine, the glandular versus the adipose tissue. Um, and one alternate thing we could do is we could calculate scale factors Previously, that was the sum total of UMIs across genes. We could calculate scale factors by uh, imposing the restriction that the average fold change between our two groups of interest should be zero. Well, what does that imply about the underlying biology? If that's going to be correct, and correct in the sense that after normalization are equivalently expressed genes, I am assuming such a thing exists, uh, show the same level of expression, well then, for that scaling to be correct, we require on the log scale that, say, for every gene that is upregulated 
in one group by make up a number, a fold change of two, then there must be some set of other genes which are downregulated so that the net sum of downregulation is negative two. You have to have that multiplicative balance up and down so that your equivalently expressed genes um, net out to zero. Um, I'm not sure I buy that assumption either, although it's a little bit better than the arithmetic uh, assumption for scaling by depth. We can get a little bit better. We can say that the median uh, fold change should be zero. This is this is nicer, this is cleaner. Obviously medians are, as we all know in this room, less sensitive to the extreme values you might have in your highly upregulated or downregulated genes. Um, and in the asymptotic limit of infinite uh, sequencing depth, maybe this would work, uh, but we live in the world of finite samples and correspondingly positive variance sampling distributions. And so if you have a strong bias, again, context of our highly active glandular tissue against relatively inactive adipose tissue, uh, if you have a strong bias in the directionality of differential regulation, say a whole bunch of genes that are upregulated and not that many that are downregulated. Well, then the median full change you pull off is going to be in that scenario higher on the sampling distribution of observed full changes among your equivalently expressed genes. You're going to get pushed away from whatever that true center should have been, and you're still going to have a bias. We have one more option. Yes, I recognize that I have just done a review of mean, median, and remote mode to a room full of statisticians. Um, but the, this is the, the solution I've been working on is that we can choose scale factors such that our modal fold change should be zero. Um, and that has the nice property, property that uh, for most scenarios, at least that I can conceive of, yell at me later if you think I'm wrong, um, this should be reasonable in the sense that we will have some perhaps plurality of genes that are equivalently expressed, if you'll go with me on that assumption, and they will, by virtue of being equivalently expressed after controlling for nuisance variation, they should have the same uh, expression level, and so their full changes should be derived from the same distribution. Um, whereas your differentially expressed to genes, even if they're the majority, are likely not all from the same distribution. They will have different fold changes. And so the peak in your fold change distribution should correspond to that peak in the distribution of equivalently expressed genes. Um, and if we look at those distributions of fold changes, uh, we can see for the roughly three different methods, scaling by depth, not average fold change zero on the left, uh, I picked SCRAN as a method that roughly works on that median assumption and the method I'm working on Rhino on the right. If we look at those distributions of fold changes around zero, we can see that the, for this comparison, at least the bias, as I'm defining it, the difference between the, the peak in fold changes, that mode and zero uh, is, well, a bit circular, obviously, but is closest to zero when you target mode. The way I'm doing that is through a method I'm working on called Rhino. Um, anyone in the room who's familiar with GLMPCA might recognize the math here. Um, it's built on a Poisson GLM uh, modeling counts, Y, G, J, G genes, uh, J cells or spots or what have you. Um, uh, working through a log link function on the uh, mean matrix mu. And for time, I'm not going to go through all the details here. Love to chat later. Um, but I'd like to focus on this middle term, um, uh, an analog to a matrix factorization, again, directly like GLMPCA, uh, where we are modeling our biological variation across cells, across spots uh, in L latent dimensions. Um, our cells or spots J are uh, embedded in the factor Z, and the loadings across genes are in W. And the reason I mentioned this is that for at least relatively simple models, the action of the log link function means that W is going to be, are we at nine already? God, well, then we're gonna, can I have 30 seconds just to finish the idea? Okay. <laughs> um, we can have the, uh, the situation where uh, our 
loadings in W uh, will correspond to estimates of the log fold change as you move through the latent dimensional space. And so we can fit this model uh, imp uh, imposing the restriction that our modal value roughly uh, in the columns of W should be zero. Um, and that's how Rhino gets fit. And we're going to skip the results, which are very pretty and show improved accuracy and improved precision, and move to the last page where I thank uh, my particular collaborators, uh, Ling Xin Chen, uh, and previous advisor, Christina Kondorsky, and current advisor, Rafael Irizarry. And catch me later or uh, on the chat or by email. I guess. You can take a couple questions while we will switch this. Betty in here. Can you say a bit more about the comparison between MPCA, like implementation wise or optimization wise? Does it only does it boil down to the size factor estimation or are there other differences? The so yeah, the, the major computational difference is in the um, penalizations which lead to that size factor estimation, GLMPCA does not do size factor estimate, uh, estimation. It'll, it has a default or you can give it your own. Um, and so that's the major conceptual difference. And then there's under hood, the hood some um, computational differences which lead to uh, the interpretations I described um, mostly in the world of optimization. Uh, so nothing that changes the statistics. But. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you again, Yuri. All right, so our next speaker, uh, um, Herrick Harkert, Karasohi from the Pacific Northwest National Labs, we're talking about spammer, spatial analysis of multi omics measurements in R. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I wasn't expecting a smaller room, so <laughs> hopefully I don't get too nervous. Um, so I will be, I am, my name is Harkira. I am from, um, I'm a postdoc at Pacific Northwest National Lab. And today I'll be talking about SPAMR, which is an R package we have been working on uh, for our spatial analysis, ooh, spatial analysis of uh, multi-omics data. And at first, this may sound a lot like Giotto, which is um, a toolbox we got to see uh, the demo for yesterday in one of the talks. Which, um, and I was very, very impressed with this tool and the talk. Um, so actually, yes, the big idea with SPAMR is very similar. But uh, I'm going to tell you in a second why it's slightly different and uh, why it's specifically tailored, how it's specifically tailored for the uh, kind of data that we are working with. Okay, so motivation for SPAM R came from our anticipated need to analyze multiple spatial proteomics data sets. Um, so one of the data sets that we were looking at is, uh, it was the spatial proteomics of human pancreas. And ooh, there was supposed to be an image, okay. So, <clears throat> Uh, here we were looking at, uh, we wanted to understand uh, islet, the microenvironment of islet cells. Islet cells are uh, involved in insulin production, so that's why they're important to study. Um, so this was a spatial proteomics data set where we wanted to understand how islet cells and their surrounding non-islet cells um, might be different. And then uh, we had a spatial proteomics data. Uh, we have a spatial proteomics data in the mouse brain where our goal is to understand differences um, between and relationships between different ROIs. And we're also looking at spatial proteomics of the spleen. Uh, where we're looking at red pulp versus white pulp. Um, so since we have, we were supposed to be working on all of these data sets at some point. Um, so we thought it would be nice to have a package um, that kind of does an end-to-end -end analysis of the spatial proteomics um, rather than, you know, like us running different scripts, clunky things um, for all the different data sets that we want to work with. So the original motivation uh, was to provide an integrated platform for an end-to-end -end analysis of spatial proteomics data. Uh, but soon we realized uh, we actually want to extend this 
capability to handle any kind of spatial omics data, but we specifically still want to um, address or pay very close attention to unique needs of each spatial omics type. So these are some existing framework and computational tools um, that we have right now. This is not an exhaustive list. This is a very small um, set of tools from small representation of tools that are out there. Um, for spatial omics, though, yes, the number of tools are a bit limited. And uh, we got to see some of these packages uh, in talks yesterday, including the spatial LIBD and the GRO. And I'll be making use of some of these uh, in, my, uh, in my package that I'm developing. We are actually making use of some of these existing tools. So SPAM are, um, the goal is not, we're not here to compete against tools that already exist, but we actually wanna add to the spatial omics tools. And as I said, current tools uh, like spatial LIBD and GeoTo are, are pretty impressive, but our needs, um, we, for our needs, we, the specific spatial proteomics data sets that we were working in, we wanted to have a more applicable and focused pipeline um, that was yeah, specifically for mass spec based proteomics data sets. So Geodo seemed uh, too extensive for our needs and well, a spatial LIBD uh, is currently designed to work with Visium data. Um, so it's a very specific platform. Um, so the current, the specific needs that aren't getting addressed in the current tools that are out there. Um, so there's a lot of missing data in, when you look at spatial proteomics uh, from mass spec, you get a high missingness. Uh, so that's something that I didn't find uh, the current spatial omics tools were really paying a lot of attention to. And also, um, there's the protein network pathway reconstruction that's also very specific to proteomics. So this is how we set out to develop this analysis pipeline. Again, paying very close attention to uh, the characteristics of mass spec based spatial proteomics data. So currently uh, the pipeline that we've developed has been in keeping spatial proteomics in mind, but eventually want, we want to extend this to any kind of omics data. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly um, uh, highlight the, some of the tools that I'm using. I am building everything uh, off of, so I'm using a spatial experiment object. And uh, in one of the talks yesterday, we talked about how in the discussion, uh, someone said this is very good for interoperability with other bioconductor packages that use the SPE frame, I'm calling it SPE, spatial experiment framework. Um, I'm using existing tools like LIMA and LEAPR. Um, LIM, and then um, these other two things that I talked about in the previous slide. So here is the kind of like the architecture of SPAMR and an example workflow. So uh, the first step is we wanna have our data as a spatial experiment object. So we provide a helper function to do that. Uh, we have a set of functions that do clustering. Um, and again, the goal with clustering is to find unsupervised patterns in your data. Um, and then this is the piece that I was saying currently is kind of missing in the current spatial omics tools. So we wanna deal with uh, missing data, let's do some imputation. Uh, we have network graph visualizations to represent information about where we, uh, different samples are located, like the distance between them and whether they're next to each other. Uh, spatial heat maps, obviously, since we're dealing with spatial data, this is a central component of our package. Um, and I think everyone here knows what's a spatial heat map. So we're just plotting a feature value on an XY coordinate system that corresponds to your original tissue image. Uh, we'll have differential expression analysis where the goal is to uh, figure out which proteins might be the most important for distinguishing between um, two groups. And we have a similar set of analyses for pathways. Uh, again, some distance-based analysis, 
uh, including correlation with distance, and then protein network reconstruction. So SPAMR is work in progress, and these are some of the functions we've finished working on. And as we work on these, we are also kind of, you know, adding new things to this diagram, maybe removing things that don't seem so fitting, um, and we're open to feedback. So uh, let's quickly show a demo, not a live demo, but like what SPAMR does. So SPAMR is currently, we do have a GitHub, um, so you can install the dev branch. Um, uh, so I will, uh, for the demonstration of the package, I'll go back to the spatial proteomics pancreas example. Um, I just wanted to show what the data looks like. Like, I think everyone in here is familiar with some kind of spatial omics data. Um, so we have a tissue image with a grid. Uh, we have the arrow pointing to the islet cell, and then everything else is a non-islet cell. Um, and then actually the, each square contains many cells, but most of the cells in that square are of the same type. Um, oh, wow, okay. All right, uh, so I'll just show you, I'm gonna skip these slides actually. So if, let's say we wanted to answer a very specific question, uh, we wanted to know what are the proteins that show significant differences between proximal and distal samples in the pancreas data set. This is kind of the SPAMR workflow you would take. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you what the results would look like at the end when you finished running all those functions. You would get a volcano plot. Um, here, the x-axis represents log two fold change, so that uh, I think everyone's familiar with that here in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, it's just saying how different are the two groups in terms of protein abundance. Uh, and then the y-axis is significance. Everything above the blue line is significant. Uh, so these are all like tweakable parameters uh, you can uh, have in your, you can put in your functions to make these kind of plots. Um, so. I pick uh, this significant protein just to show you. We can go back to our spatial, we can go back to the spatial plot function and see how that actually looks on the tissue grid. And you can see actually that uh, this, you do see all the distal cells are like yellow, green, and then the proximals are blues and purples, which are kind of at the two ends of the spectrum, you know, kind of confirming that this is a significant protein for differences between those two groups. Okay, again, we're, uh, this is all work in progress and we're very open to feedback. Um, and if there's anything that I'm not aware of that you think would be helpful for SPAMR, I'd love to hear from you. This is our SPAMR team. I thank all of them for providing, uh, especially my mentors, Dr. Goslin and Dr. McDermott for providing a vision for SPAMR. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, I actually have not worked that much with mRNA data, so I don't know the answer. But is there something particular asking about the just like a uh, distribution for proteomics? Well, I was just wondering for uh, mRNA, like often we use like a negative binomial distribution, and now this is like the first right skew, and then we do a lot. Is that related? Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, right. sorry, I don't know if anyone else knows. Another question? Um, so, one of the cool things about this is to be the imputation. Um, imputation with mass spec is obviously a really contentious kind of thing about how to approach it. How are you approaching your imputation? 
Uh, we haven't really gone into all the details of it yet, but um, I know there is an existing package called Optimus that we were looking into, which actually has a whole bunch of implication methods, but this is very early stage and we haven't gotten. If you have suggestions, I'd love to. Okay. So we'll do the one last one. Hey, Ying, can you share your screen? Great presentation. Um, yes, no, I'm yes. sharing my screen. Okay. No, sorry, we aren't seeing it. Sorry, keep going. It's <laughs> sorely needed in terms of uh, tools for good freedom. I'm just wondering, do you envision Cameron to also support multiple omics? So, like, expression, I can follow you up on that, but like expression and protein in the same tissue? Or do you envision Cameron to be like individuals, multiple, multiple types of omics for different types of omics? Yeah, you're asking like for the same, let's say for the same, same spatial, same same spatial. If we have yeah. two or more. That is eventually the goal, but um, I don't think that would be the first step. Okay. That would be really big contribution as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I can put your slides up, Ping, but you'll have to tell me when to advance the next slide if you because we're not seeing your share. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you. Mm, okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm sharing screen, but it seems like it doesn't work. All right. Well, I'll do it from here and you just tell me when to advance the slide. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Pei, a PhD student in Mark Robinson's lab in Zurich. And today I'll talk about this method called DSpace. Uh, it's designed for spatial transcriptomics data to detect spatial variable genes via differential expression testing of spatial clusters. To go to the next slide, thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, in spatial transcriptomics data, it's often possible, for example, in human brain or in tumor tissue in mouse brain to label tissue region manually or via spatial clustering algorithms such as Bayes space or STLearn. And these algorithms cluster cells or spots to identify spatial domains based on both spatial coordinates and gene expression. Next slide. And another popular analysis per performed in spatial data is identifying spatially variable genes, genes whose expression profiles vary across tissue. And many methods have been proposed to identify such spatial variable genes, like the spatial DE, spatial DE2, Marine Spark Spark X, SVG, Spark GCN, and TransSeq. However, many methods are computationally demanding or they only allow individual samples and multiple samples cannot be processed. And few tools can incorporate information of interesting spatial structures. Uh, it's on, and what's more, it's only possible to test the entire tissue. People cannot perform spatial variable testing on specific region. Next slide. So to address these limitations, we propose this space as a framework to detect spatial variable genes. And this space uses pre-annotated spatial clusters as a proxy for the actual spatial information. So the key assumption here is that spatial clusters should successfully summarize spatial information. We then fit a negative binomial model via HR, a popular tool for differential gene expression with spatial clusters as covariates and perform a differential expression test to detect spatial variable genes. We benchmarked our method against seven other methods and TransSeq was excluded for computational reasons. 
for the benchmarks, we consider it three real data sets from different technologies. We also generated various simulation based on these three real data sets. Yeah, next slide, please. And for simulation study, we editing Giotto's simulator. So uh, the basic idea is that in each simulation, we generated uniform patterns and also spatial variable genes pattern. And then for those uniform patterns, we randomly permuting spots across tissue. And then for spatial variable genes pattern, we rearrange the real data arrangement into a highly abundant region and a lowly abundant region follow in five distinct spatial structures. And here I show you first three spatial patterns, the bottom, the circular, and the pattern based on the manual annotations. Notice that those green spots have higher expression than the red one. And, but uh, in these three scenarios, all spatial variable genes follow the same spatial structure which is unlikely to happen in real data. So we add uh, two more additional methods, uh, two more additional patterns. Next slide. Yes, thanks. Um, we call it a mixture pattern and inverted mixture pattern. For mixture pattern, so 20% of spatial variable genes will follow the first subpattern, and then 20% of spatial variable genes will follow the second subpattern, and so on. So, in, so finally, um, in in one simulation, um, spatial variable genes will follow different spatial structure. Yes, and next slide. And here are true positive rates versus false discovery rates for all methods for three data sets and the five distinct spatial structures. Uh, overall, these space controls for false discovery rate and have a st high statistical power in all scenarios. Yeah, next slide. We also investigated these space ability to uh, identify key areas of the tissue affected by spatial variable genes, which means that we test whether the average expression in a particular region is significantly higher or lower than the average expression of the remaining region. Like uh, here are four expression plots for, for spatial variable genes detected by these space. And um, those spatial variable genes were selected uh, were identified by selecting high expression in one matter, low expression in one matter, or high expression in layer three or low expression in layer three. Overall, 93% of times we uh, these space can identify the main spatial variable cluster. Yes, next. What's more, we simulated three biological replicates with consistent spatial variable genes. And then we fit these space in both single sample and multi-sample modes. Although, uh, while both approaches get control for false discovery rate and jointly model multiple samples has a um, significantly increase of the true positive rate in all scenarios. Yes, and next slide. For the real data analysis, as we don't know the ground truth, so here we just measured how consistent results are across samples by using Jacquard index. And these space spark, spark X display the highest Jacquard index, indicates greater coherency of top ranked genes across samples. Yes, and next slide. Uh, and finally, we test the computational efficiency of all, uh, all methods in real data analysis. SPARGC and SPARCX are the fastest methods in our benchmarks, and followed by DSpace, SpatialDE, and SpatialDE2. Noted that 
uh, this space time is largely depends on the computational cost required to obtain spatial clusters. And next slide. Thank you. So uh, in summary, uh, we also acknowledge some uh, limitations of this framework. So first, this space is not a spatial model. It relies on spatial clusters that capture well the spatial features. Also, we are aware of the double dipping issues in this framework because we use data ties to determine spatial cluster and also to look for differences across clusters. But in, our, uh, in all our benchmarks, this issue does not impact performance results and also we think that each individual gene contributes marginally to spatial clustering results, which are using based on the expression data from thousands of genes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, your time is up. Can you wrap it up, please? Yeah, uh, the, the, and the advantage of our method is that overall we do see high accuracy so like we see uh, this method can control for the false positive rate, false discovery rate, and we still have high statistical power. What's more, we can test individual regions and identify the key spatial variable clusters. What's more, we provide multi-sample options. And in our analysis, we do see that jointly model multiple samples lead to a higher true positive rate. Mm. And this space is a computationally efficient and flexible methods can work with any spatial omics data from distinct technologies. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Okay, any quick, we are really behind time. So any quick questions while I get the next one up? Either online. Anybody? Oh, yeah? yeah. Go ahead, say it. Um, does it mean like uh, the users have to define the region of interest? Yes, if you have an uh, interest in the region, then you can identify this region. But if you don't have it, then we can also um, test the entire tissue. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Oh, and I apologize. I actually never. I didn't introduce PNK. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so next speaker, last speaker is Xiang Huang from McMaster University. So we're just doing yes. So hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, proposing a statistical models for spatial multi multiplex on beam imaging data analysis to uncover the tumors, uh, tumors microenvironments. Oops, my bad. So I would like to quickly introduce MIB. So MIB is an imaging system that produces high resolution image for up to 40 markers at the single cell level. And it is a powerful tool to prop the tumors microenvironment as shown here uh, in the pilot study example. And we get the MIB data of, um, collects the MIBI data by pre first preparing a MIBI slide with the tumor's uh, tissues. And then we go through the staining process and also the analyze a process by the MIBI machine. And we will get a MIBI image like uh, output uh, as the output. And this kind of image can, uh, can sorry, uh, this image can be color, color coded to the proteins markers and also reflects the proteins marker intensity. And we also want to perform some cell segmentation on this kind of cost, uh, on this kind of image and find the center of the cells. And then we can collect the uh, spatial information and also the markers intensity for each cells. And then next, we want to use the catalyst or bioconductor package to cluster all these cells to define their subtypes. And then combining the patient's information, we will generate a final output table that contains all the above information for the tissue, uh, for the tumor's tissue. And this analysis pipeline is also uh, implemented into our interactive r shiny apps that can allowing uh, the researchers to streamline their work. 
So with the outputs table, we are interested in knowing the point patterns in the patient uh, samples. So in the plots that we showed, that each point is a cell, and they are colored, uh, they are color coded to their corresponding cell type. So for example, the red are uh, colored by, uh, like the, the tumor cell is colored in red, and the point size is actually the cell size. And if you look closely, we notice that um, the tumor cells tend to have a larger cell size than all the other non-tumor cells. So our research goal is to uncover the spatial structure of the multi-type point patterns and want to apply it and find the tumor's microenvironment in the triple negative breast cancer patients. So for example, uh, the TME1 in the patient four in our patient sample defines the border of the tumor cells and the TM, whereas the TME4 defines the non-tumor border, uh, the non sorry, the non-tumor border and next, we want to talk about methods. Uh, we want to talk. We want to pick a distribution that can describe our data patterns, and Atchison at uh, illustrates that the Dirichlet distributions fails to describe the concave data patterns uh, in 1982, and we have decided to go with using the latent Dirichlet allocation because LDA can describe any possible data patterns, including the concave data patterns. And, but we still need to make the connections from the media data to like the NLP techniques such as LDA. So LDA generally needs a corpus, which is a collection of a document. In, in our case, would be a cohort, which is a collection of samples, of patient samples. And each patient samples can be seen as the documents in the patient data. And the cells community it, are actually the topics in the patient samples. And cells are the words, and cell types are the terms of the words, uh, of the cells, sorry. And by applying the uh, LDA, we can obtain and visualize the topic distributions uh, across all of the samples. And also the cell, and we also with the cell phenotype distribution in each topic. And according to Chen's paper, uh, spatial LDA defines spatial regularizations, which is the Vernoni's partitionings of cell uh, positions. And this shows the global parameterization of the cell type co occurrence, which means the spatial dependence um, is actually similar across all the patient sample. And now we want to compare our, uh, the spatial LDA with cell with our uh, LDA with cell. We notice here, if you look uh, closely, that the spatial topics discovered uh, with LDA is similar to the topics discovered without using the spatial structure in the TME. And now the question becomes, what is the quantitative wave of, of measuring the similarity between the spatial eagle maps with different topics. So the spatial LDA approach is using the Veroni's partitioning of cells position, which defines the spatial wave matrix. And the spatial wave matrix can be further decomposed uh, to find out uh, to find out what's how much of the spatial dependence it explains. And then we want to fit the spatial LDA with the, uh, with the spatial weight matrix. And we com compute the cell distribution in topics T. Then we will calculate the RV coefficient to see how closely, how closely related uh, uh, with the spatial eagle maps and the topics. And in our examples, uh, the RV coefficient is 0 0.34. So the proposed method we have is like one of our contribution is we want to propose a geometrical distortion analysis based on the Vernoni uh, tessellations. So our approach is we found that um, the cell side is actually meaningful to findings the tumor's microenvironments. So we want to first compute the quantile of the cell size and we want to divide the windows, which is the dimensions of the patient samples based on this number of Q quantiles. And next, we want to randomly choose a cell from each cell as the seed for the Vernoni tessellations. And we then want to compute the spatial wave matrix based on each number of uh, the, sorry, each numbers of Q contails, and then uh, find uh, the, uh, the Egan map for each spatial wave matrix. 
Then um, we want to fit the spatial LDH with each of the uh, spatial, spatial wave matrix. And finally, the last step is to compute the RV coefficients between the Egan maps and um, Egan maps with the topics. And in that case, the, the, the RV will be based on Q. And we will use the distortions um, analysis to find the best Q. So we want to apply our proposed methods into some triple negative breast cancer. And the TMBC data we use um, is from Kieran's paper that contains 39 patient samples with around 180,000 cells. And it has 36 protein markers with 16 unique cell types. And the result, result shows that if you use 50 quantiles, it actually generates a higher co RV coefficient than if you're only using 10 quantiles. And by visualizing the points patterns uh, of each topics in the patient sample, we actually found that topic ones can only be used to describe the TME of patient four. And this indicating the TME of patient four is compartmentalized. But in patient 12, that topic ones and topic four can be used to uh, can be used to describe TME of patient 12. And this indicating the TME is dispersed and immune, immune cells proportion are larger than in the patient four. And in other words, that the immune cells are actually attacking uh, the tumor cells. So to conclude that uh, the proposed method is based on the spatial dependence distortion analysis and the topic learned from the patient samples are correlated with the spatial variations of the cells locations. And we do encounter some challenges during our research. That the first one is uh, the compute, computing for different Q is computationally expensive, especially if we want to find the best Q. And the second one is the number of tiles across the sample are the same. And Dr. Jenkins Nathan's lab is currently working on the spatial LDA. And we tried to like, so seeking for solutions to solve these kind of two challenges. And we are planning to submit a manuscript and also a package to bioconductor in the near future. And here's some extra resources for this, um, for this talk is my GitHub page and my undergrad thesis. And we also want to acknowledge uh, the fundings for Dr. Jigen Nathan, Dr. Jigen Nathan's research labs. And thank you. All right, we have time for a couple questions. Um, so uh, you're using the word eigenmap. I, um, maybe I missed or maybe. Uh, so um, what procedure do you use to select the, eigen, uh, the, the eigenvectors in word eigenmap? So we are actually using the Morin's eye. We are using the Morin's eye approach. So if you look at the, the slide that uh, we use the spatial weight matrix to find, this, uh, to find the eigenmap, and we use the Morin's eye and then we sort them out. We choose the four, like in our example, with the one with the R we coefficient is 0 0.34. We choose the four eigenvector that explain the most variations, uh, that explain the most spatial dependency in, in like the four, sorry, the four eigenvector that explain the most uh, spatial dependence. And the numbers of sorry, uh, the numbers of eigenvector will be changed like by where we, by case. So do you mean like uh, you, you try to minimize the more anxiety? Yes. Hmm. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Thank me again and joining all our speakers or <laughs> thanking all our speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay. Great. We've got six minutes to get some coffee and sugar before the next session.